So today what I thought I would uh, focus on for our 15 or 20 minutes would first be just kind of a general overview about what we're talking about with autism. Um, in terms of uh, kind of what, what we do know about it, just so we're all on the same page. And then I'll really focus on uh, kind of the social cognition aspect, what, um, uh, what's going on in the brain in autism. So to start, just jumping in, uh, focusing on autism, what do we know about it? Uh, well, we know it's a neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it's a disorder based in the brain uh, and that impacts the development of the brain and that changes over the course of development. That's one thing we know about it. Um, we know that there is no currently any, uh, there's no biological genetic test for, uh, for autism. The way we diagnose the disorder is simply by uh, observing uh, behaviors uh, in three different domains. And the three different domains we're talking about are the social domain, uh, the communication domain, and the third domain of restricted and repetitive interests and behaviors. So uh, given there's no, te uh, no diagnostic test that uses a, bi a biological assay or a no blood test, what we do is we have fa families come on in to our clinic. Um, we do a semi-structured observation with the child. We talk with the parents, get a, a sense of the history, try to understand what's going on in the family. And then we do a whole bunch of uh, tasks with the child to that elicit social communicative acts and look for uh, the presence or absence of behaviors in these three different domains, again, the social language or this third domain of re restricted or repetitive interests or behaviors. We call that last one category C because that's such a mouthful, we just call it category C. Um, so wh what I might do as a clinician, the child comes in, um, first thing I'm going to look for are behaviors in that social domain. So I'm going to look for uh, any challenges or impairments in uh, the use of eye contact or facial expressions. Um, I, I might look for uh, any challenges in that sort of social or emotional reciprocity, that back and forth nature of, of interactions. Um, and then in chatting with families and parents, I'll look, be looking for things like any challenges in peer relationships, um, reduced friendships, things like that. So again, just looking for uh, the presence of, of uh, or absence of behaviors in this, in this first domain. The other thing I look for is in that second domain. And what I look for there is, uh, first thing I'm gonna think about is, has there been any delays in language? Or is there any, uh, the presence of any atypical language? And by atypical language, the things I might be looking for are uh, the use of stereotypic speech, um, which is when um, there's a variety of stereotypic uh, examples of stereotypic speech. One might be a child that repeats back what he or she just heard you just say, um, or that repeats back things like phrases from a movie um, or phrases that maybe a teacher might have said. And those sorts of phrases can be used uh, productively or sort of just out of the blue that aren't very very productive. So one example was a kiddo that I used to work with. Um, when, it was t when he was kind of done, when he was ready uh, to leave or he was done with the task, he would say, time to get on the bus. And that's what he would always say, no matter what, um, you know, we're done doing the testing, time to get on the bus, time to get on the bus. And that was sort of his phrase. He used it appropriately in that well, I sort of knew he, it's time for he wants to get out of here. But really, it's kind of an interesting idiosyncratic phrase to say, I'm done with this task, I'm ready to move on. So things like that. Uh, I might also look for uh, atypical language, things like neologisms. What neologisms are, are those are uh, invented or made up words. Or um, so an example of that might be a kiddo who refers to shapes as a certain thing, like all triangles are a mashuda, or um, all rectangles are a, a plin, or those sorts of things are just new words meaning the same thing. Um, other atypical uh, language examples might be a kiddo that refers to grandma by her age, um, calling uh, steam, hot rain, things like this. So we're looking for these atypical, these examples of atypical use of language. Also, I would look for um, challenges in that back and forth aspect of conversation. Um, a kiddo that might uh, carry on and tell me all about his topic of interest and I might say, oh, but, and I've been just, but I think, oh, but really is not interested in hearing anything that I have to say or sort of engaging in that back and forth aspect of that interaction. So those are the things I might look for in that second domain, that, that language communication domain. And in that third category, um, there are a number of things we might look for, and these are kind of often the things that people generally think of when, when you sort of talk about autism, but, but really, as I'll talk about later, really the more defining features are these impairments in these social communicative acts. At any rate, so the things I might look for in this, in this third category is I might look for interests that are unusual either in their intensity or their focus. Um, an interest that's unusual in its focus might be, say for example, this kiddo we used to work with who was 13 and loved cameras. It's a very appropriate interest. Sure, cameras are kind of cool. But this kiddo knew every single possible thing you could possibly know about a camera and every different type of Minolta and Canon and Nikon and 
and he just really wanted to talk about all these different interests in cameras. He wanted to talk about that nonstop, to the point where it kind of became problematic because not everyone wanted to hear about all these different types of uh, cameras and such. So that would be an interest that's unusual in, its, in intensity. Uh, there are also interests that are just unusual in their focus. So we had a kiddo uh, that I used to work with who loved toilets. And so he'd come on into the, to the room, and any time, anytime he came to a new place, he wanted to check out what toilet was there and what kind of toilet uh, and how it flushed and want to explore it and want to uh, check out the seats and look at the toilet seats. It's kind of an interesting, unusual, uh, uh, odd interest there. Um, uh, other interests that, that have come up over the years, interest in street signs, um, traffic lights, things, uh, things like that. So these are, we kind of uh, look for the presence of uh, these sorts of interests, uh, as well as we also look for um, other things like repetitive motor mannerisms, things sometimes called hand flapping or finger flicking, these sorts of uh, repetitive motor mannerisms, or other repetitive behaviors, things like lining up uh, toys uh, repeatedly, um, holding uh, toy objects from one height and dropping down to another repeatedly. Um, things like this. Also in this third domain, we're going to look for uh, challenges in routines, or, cha or sorry, challenges in tra uh, changes into routines, challenges in transitions, this notion of an insistence on sameness, this is what we call it. So looking for things like this. So this is kind of how we characterize and how we diagnose autism. Again, there's, there's no specific test. It's people uh, just sort of watching and looking at behaviors and trying to figure out, well, gosh, do you meet enough of these different criteria in each of these three domains to, uh, to reach a threshold? So uh, generally when I'm talking with families, I try to explain this because I think there's sometimes like, is there this mystery of how we diagnose? It's, it's really not a mystery. It's kind of straightforward. It's basically a, a checklist. And I wish the science was better, and that's what I'm ho talking about is we're hoping to move that better, but that's where we're at right now in terms of our, our science of the diagnostic process. So other just little basic things we know about autism, just kind of we'll want to run through these before I jump through, uh, jump into talking about social cognition. So other things we know about autism. Well, we know that it does not discriminate based on ethnicity or socioeconomic class. Um, we know that it seems to impact boys uh, more often than girls. The ratio of children that's been that have been diagnosed with autism is about f uh, three to four boys for every one girl. Um, we know that it is a uh, strongly genetic disorder. Twin studies suggest that uh, 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 autism is highly heritable. Heritability estimates are about 90%, which means that when we think about um, autism, about 90% can be accounted for um, by, by genetics. And so that's one thing we know about autism. We know that we have an intervention that works. Behaviorally based interventions actually can make a, a significant impact and change the trajectory for kids with autism. We know that. Uh, we also know that it's costly and time uh, intensive, um, but we know it works. Other things that we know are probably a better way to talk about autism is actually autisms as opposed to autism. Because what we're talking about when we talk about autism is really probably 20, 50, 100, maybe 500 different things that we just call autism. Uh, right now we know that about 20% of all cases of autism we can identify what that causes genetically. And it's a number of different causes. So. Um, as we gain more understanding about the genetics of autism, we can uh, parse out these different um, subtypes of autism. Currently, there are three subtypes that you generally hear about. Um, autistic disorder, Asperger's uh, syndrome, or pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And that's gonna be changing uh, as the new diagnostic manual comes out. We'll be moving away from that, that system. That's kind of where we're at right now in terms of how we uh, subtype. It doesn't seem like it's appropriate way. We're not capturing all the kiddos uh, in the appropriate manner. And I'm happy to talk more about that as well. Um, so what else? We also know uh, that really when we think about autism or autisms, we're talking about a disorder of social cognition. The real primary focal impairment that we see in autism is this disorder of uh, social cognition. And so what is that when I say social cognition? Well, that's the ability to uh, detect, attend to, and process information in our social world, and then use that information in the social world to guide our behavior. So if we think about it, processing social information is very different from processing other sort of information in the world. Um, so if I might look out and see a tree, or the color red, or a video camera, or a bright light, these are all stimuli that I'm processing with my brain. Um, but if I'm looking out and looking at faces or looking at someone making a movement, that's very different in that all those things that you're doing within my body, I can actually do, right? So it's very different. I can't uh, be a color. I can't, um, I can't move like a ball, but I can move the way your hands move. I can make the same facial expression that you might make. Uh, and so what that suggests is that 
um, processing social information really uh, pulls from different parts of the brain uh, than we might uh, use when we're processing other bits of information. And so as we move forward and try to understand kind of what's happening in the brain then is might there be some neurological mechanism, some mechanism in the brain that allows me to map um, kind of what I see you doing onto my own, into my own system, into my own body? And recently we found something that seems to fit the bill as a mechanism to map my ability to process what I'm seeing out there into my own um, motor system, my own, my own uh, brain cells that uh, control the way I move. So let me just show a brief little slide here. It's quite, it's quite busy, um, but what this slide shows is just highlights a number of aspects of the social brain, um, parts of the brain that are involved in processing social information or involved in social cognition. And uh, I won't talk about all these things. Um, I could talk about all these different areas of the brain, and we could be here until tomorrow or maybe the next day, but well, that might not work, and I think I'd probably run out of beer by then. So what I'll do tonight is just really focus on one, uh, on one part of the, the, the social brain, and that's the mirror neuron system. Um, I will just say all these different parts of the brain uh, that I'm highlighting here, um, most of this understanding, most of our understanding of the social brain really comes out of the work that we're doing in autism. Um, which is sort of interesting to me as a, as a researcher is uh, by studying autism, it helps us understand uh, all of development, which I think is pretty exciting. So the mirror neuron system, what, what is that all about? And some of you may have heard about this because it's gotten, it's gotten a lot of, lot of airtime in the media. Um, so what mirror neurons are, are a class of motor neurons. Motor neurons are, are neurons, brain cells, uh, that control our, our motor abilities, our ability to move, grab something like a beer, um, but that also have other properties that allow us to, um, that activate when we also see someone performing an action. So let me give you a little background. So in the mid-early 90s, some researchers in Italy were studying uh, the motor system. They were studying motor cells. And what they did is they had these two uh, monkeys plugged into a little machine where the monkeys are sitting there. They open up the monkeys' brains and they pluck the little electrodes down at their brains. I'm really glad I don't do this sort of work. It seems kind of gross and kind of nasty, so I'm happy I don't do that sort of stuff. But they open up the brains, stick these electrodes in, and they can record activity uh, in, at, from very sp specific cells, not just like whole bodies of cells, but actually specific cells. And so what they were doing is it was, it was at the end of the day, they'd been studying these motor cells, act activation in these monkeys, and they ha were studying how monkeys were, they would pick up raisins or pick up uh, paper or uh, pick up little objects. And so the way this system works is you have a little monkey plugged in, little electrodes plugging into the brain, coming out, and they plug into an amplifier. And every time one of those neurons activates, you hear a little click. So what might happen is, as I'm a monkey, with electrode sticking out of my head, and I might be reaching to grab uh, my raisin, and as I'm reaching, the amplifier would go click, 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 and so it's sort of running and making this noise, so you don't even really have to be looking, and you can sort of basically hear the activation that's happening in the brain. So it was at the end of the day, and these researchers had, um, were kind of done with their experiment. There were still some um, raisins on the left on the plate. And so what the scientists were doing was they were cleaning up, and a scientist reached down to grab a raisin, and he hears click, 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 click. It's kind of like, what's going on? I'm, I'm not hooked up. Click, 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 click. Uh, kind of freaked out a little bit. And then did a series of experiments after sort of thinking, wow, this is crazy. These are motor neurons that are activating, not when the monkey's moving, because he looks over, and the monkey's just sitting there, plain as can be, just happily watching this experiment to grab the, grab the raisins. Experimenter reaches down again, click, 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 click. And said, wow, this is amazing. So these are motor neurons. I didn't anticipate they would have any sort of uh, visual property, any property that impacts um, the visual experience. And then a series of experiments that demonstrated that these exact same neurons were performing more than just one action. They were not only activating when the monkey performed an action, but when this monkey, well, there's actually two, when these two monkeys watched someone else perform an action. So what they thought is, wow, in monkeys, this might sort of help um, this process by having the same neurons activate might allow monkeys to, without having to sort of process anything, might help un monkeys understand what other monkeys are doing in their world. So, wow, I see that monkey doing, doing this action, grabbing that banana. I can get it because I have a, an immediate representation in my own bodily system. I understand that the monkey's grabbing a banana. So people got pretty excited about this notion. Um, this work done in, in, um, in monkeys. And some, some researchers here in the U.S., Actually, interesting enough, Marco Iacoboni, who actually comes from the same university where the folks that did the primate research, 
he happens to work with uh, with humans, and he looked at the same sort of uh, uh, did, uh, looked at the same sort of uh, mirror neuron activation in humans. And so what what he did was uh, he had people sort of lie down and crawl into a big long tube, the fMRI scanner. It's kind of different. You can't just sort of open up brains and plug in electrodes into humans quite as well. So you have to kind of think of other creative ways to do it. Uh, and so he used fMRI. And what he did was he had um, adults sort of lay down an fMRI scanner, and he just had them move them move their fingers sort of performing very simple uh, finger actions, and then also watch uh, other people perform simple finger actions. And what he found was, um, I'm not really sure how helpful the slide will be, but what he found was that uh, a, part of the, a specific part of the brain uh, that is what's called the homolog, which is uh, very similar to the monkey brain, the part of the monkey brain where we found these mirror neurons, that same part of the brain in humans activates not only when someone performs an action of flicking your finger, but also watching someone else flick the finger. And so he suggested, wow, here's some first evidence that we actually might have this same sort of system in humans. And so people got really excited at this point. And actually one uh, researcher down in San Diego said, holy cow, sort of the studying, the finding of, hu of mirror neurons in humans is like, um, that, that is to psychology what the understanding of finding DNA was to the field of biology. So people got really excited, like this is the next big thing, uh, this notion that we have a neurological mechanism of the same neurons that are performing two different actions that they can um, activate both when we perform an action and we observe someone else uh, uh, perform an action. So people got really excited and started really thinking about, well, what does this mean then? We have this mechanism for self or other mapping. I can just look at someone, I can see what they're doing, and I have this immediate representation in my body. I don't even have to think about it. I have this immediate representation in my body of what they're doing. So people got really excited thinking about this and thought, hmm, well, this seems, this system might help out and might sort of provide the, that mechanism for understanding uh, how we imitate because at this point there have been a lot of theories, but no one had a, a good neurological mechanism for how we imitate, um, a mechanism for how we feel empathy for others, uh, um, a mechanism for sort of uh, underlying the concept of theory of mind. Theory of mind is that notion that I'm me, you're you, I realize that I have a mind, and I have goals and intentions, and you have goals and intentions that, are, that could be somewhat different from mine. Um, as well, there are some theories that that this system might underlie, underlie really the evolution of language as we move from non-human primates to humans. So as we start thinking about that list of that, that, that laundry list of things that a mirror neuron system might underlie, imitation, empathy, theory of mind, language, you start thinking, well, gosh, these are all things that are impaired in autism. Might, might it be dysfunction of this system that is underlying uh, the social cognition impairments we see in autism? So we thought, heck, let's take a look at that. Um, but again, I'm sort of faced with this notion of, gosh, how do we test this in an individual um, with autism? Um, we're certainly not going to open up brains. Uh, fMRI could work, um, but it's challenging um, in order to sort of complete an fMRI task. It means you've got to be able to feel very comfortable laying still in a little tiny tube where there's gigantic sloud pounding over and over and over and over. Uh, and for an individual who might have some sensory sensitivities and maybe some challenges with executive functioning, you can imagine that's kind of a challenge. Um, so we had another method, and that's the use of electroencephalography. Uh, and what that is, is, let's have a little picture here. What we do is we have a little, uh, little cap um, that, uh, that collects uh, the random transient electrical changes in the brain's activity in response to various stimuli. And um, we just collect it right from the scalp through little electrodes, actually 128 to be exact. We just soak these little electrodes in a warm sponge and attach them on the, on the, on the scalp. Doesn't hurt. It takes about 10 seconds to get it on the head and maybe another 90 seconds to make sure we're getting good reading from, from the scalp. And we can do it with uh, kiddos as young as my daughter, who was a year old at the time and really hated this. So um, <laughs> this is the only picture she's not screaming, but that's okay, that's beside the point. Um, uh, and we can do it all the way through uh, individuals who are um, or adults. And so it doesn't require, this task doesn't require um, the same level of of needing to stay still, or to follow in complex directions, or to worry about sensory stimuli. There are still some sensory challenges with having a wet cap on your head, so um, it's really not easy, but it's better, I would say, it's easier than fMRI. Um, and so what we do is, um, from this electroactivity, we sort of we run through these cables into the amplifier, and into the amplifier, then it translates this into um, sort of electrical activity that we can read. And there's lots of different ways to then look at that electrical ac activity. One of the ways is to look at uh, the various rhythms in the brain. There's a number of different uh, rhythms in the brain you might have heard about. There's alpha rhythm, beta rhythm, theta rhythm, things like that. There's also a rhythm called the EEG mu rhythm. 
And what this is believed to reflect is it's believed to reflect this mirror neuron system. Uh, and the theory behind, or so the rationale behind that is this. So the, the EEG mu rhythm was actually first discovered back in the 50s when a couple EEG researchers had college kids sit down in a room and watch movies of boxing, which I, that also wouldn't want to be research that I'd want to do. I'm sure it's fine for some people. It wouldn't be the research I want to do, watching boxing all day long. But at any rate, um, so they had these, uh, these college kids watching boxing, and what they found was that this, uh, this mu rhythm, the EEG mu rhythm, attenuated, which means that the, uh, the amplitude got smaller when individuals were either punching other people or when they were watching people get punched. And so they thought, wow, this seems like this might be uh, sort of an index of this matching system, this, um, this mirror neuron system. So uh, the theory is that when you're at rest, if I'm sitting here at rest, just kind of relaxing, the all the underlying neurons, the activa activation of my brain, uh, all, those, all these neurons are firing synchronously. So we get sort of this characteristic wave band here, um, oscillations, about uh, eight oscillations per second, and sort of um, with this, this amplitude here. But then when I perform an action, like grab a beer, or watch someone else grab a beer, I get a uh, reduction of that amplitude, so the, the waveform's gonna reduce somewhat like this. So that's kind of the theory, uh, in a, in a sort of a rough, um, broad brush stroke, that's the theory behind what's going on with the mu rhythm. So given that this is a potential index of this mirror neuron system, I thought, well, heck, let's just use this system. We know it can work, and let's look at this in individuals with autism. So I brought a, a whole bunch of adults with autism on into the lab, as well as a whole bunch of adults who did not, who did not have autism, and we had put that put the cap on, silly cap on everyone, and did um, a variety of experiments where we just showed a lot of different stimuli. So one of the things we did was um, we had them sitting with their cap on, and we had them watch, um, well, they had, we, we had them watch me grabbing a little wooden block. Seems pretty simple, pretty boring, and it, it was. Um, but we called this little wooden block the manipulandum. We, that might made it sort of introduce some excitement into it. Um, not much, really, but at any rate, we had them watch me grabbing this little wooden block, or we uh, had the same wooden block on the, on the table in front of them, they would grab the wooden block when prompted, or we had them imitate me grabbing this wooden block, so while they're watching me grab the wooden block, they're grabbing their own wooden block, or we just recorded activity when they were at rest. There are a couple of other conditions in there as well, but this was the, the main condition we were interested in. And what we found was, kind of as we expected, our typical individuals, um, when just at rest, we get this characteristic um, waveform action, and again, this is in our typical individuals. When they watched, or when they grabbed the wooden block by themselves, we get this reduction in amplitude of this waveform. And then when they watched me grabbing this wooden block, we get the same reduction in amplitude. So um, really suggesting, okay, great, we're, we're getting the same, we're getting this, exp uh, this finding that we'd expect. Our individuals with autism had a, uh, a slightly different uh, presentation. Again, when at rest, we got the same sort of characteristic waveform. When uh, they themselves grabbed the wooden block, we saw that reduction in amplitude. But when they watched me grab that wooden block, we didn't see that same reduction in amplitude. We saw some, some t for sure, um, but certainly not to the degree we would expect. Really kind of suggesting there's something disrupted in this, in this matching system, in this mirror neuron system. So I just have a slide here with a lot of words, kind of just say, well, so what? And you're like, great, wow. So this is exciting. We find this differential uh, mirror neuron system finding, this differential activity uh, in our individual's autism. What does that mean? Who cares? So, well, the first thing as a scientist I'm excited about, well, cool, we, we found a brain system that seems to be functioning differ differently in autism. That was more exciting for me, not maybe for uh, sort of uh, the public at large. Um, oh, sweet, that's a band, I think. Not me, I think. <laughs> sweet. All right, I better wrap up because it sounds like the band's going to go on. Um, and uh, other things that um, this might mean. So I think about it and sort of what are the implications for how we understand what autism is, um, how we treat autism, uh, and then um, kind of future work. And so in the how we understand autism category, I would s suggest that looking at this mu rhythm, it's possible this ser could serve as an endophenotype in genetic studies. And what that means is, the way, the way we do genetic studies now is we identify a phenotype. The phenotype is the outward, outward expression of a given genotype or uh, outward expression of our, our genes. But in autism, that's quite far removed from the actual genotype. So what genes do is they, they code for proteins, proteins code for molecules, we establish these molecules that impact brain structure and function, then we have development. We're going through so many different steps to finally get to uh, the phenotype of autism. And it makes it really challenging to, to 
find our way back through all these different pathways to identify what genes might be involved in autism. So the idea of an endophenotype is basically just a phenotype, an outward expression of genes, that is a little bit closer to the genotype than the phenotype of interest that you're really looking for, which is autism. Uh, some work that's been done with, um, another example might be work that's been done in reading disability. So in reading disability, again, a pretty large, broad um, disorder, um, what folks found that was that disruptions in phonemic processing, your ability to process the phonemes, the smallest um, units in language, um, by disruptions in that actually um, occurs also in reading disability, and that's a little bit closer to the genotype than actual reading disability, challenges in reading. So sort of an example how looking at endophenotypes can actually move things forward. By identifying this endophenotype in reading disability, they're actually, uh, scientists were able to identify uh, and link that to a very specific region of the genome. So it's possible uh, that by studying the mu rhythm that more, that this could in fact be this uh, expression of the genes that are a little bit closer to the genes than autism at large. Um, it's also possible then that we could use this as an early indicator for autism. So right now, as I mentioned, we diagnose uh, autism based on the presence or absence of behavior in these three different domains. And uh, on average, diagnosis across the country now is somewhere between ages three and four. Now parents, on average, most often report that something's not quite right with their child's development at about 18 months of age. And we know from uh, some of the work we've been doing at the Autism Center and elsewhere uh, that we can actually, in a research setting, um, uh, with some degree of uh, reliability, identify kiddos who are going to go on to develop autism from kiddos who are uh, developing typically at about a year of age. So we've got quite a span there from uh, a year when we know we can uh, make some definitive um, estimations, 18 months when parents are saying, whoa, there's something not quite right, to three years old when kiddos are finally gonna get a diagnosis. We also know that we have an intervention that works. And we know that if we intervene, intervene earlier, we can actually change that trajectory and impact um, and the course of the child's, uh, child's disorder. So if we had a, a marker, some sort of um, early indicator that we could use with these infants who we think might be at risk for autism, uh, then that might help us get uh, intervention started even earlier. Uh, so another potential use of, uh, of using this sort of information. Although I have to say, Given how nightmarishly hard it is to get the cap on young kiddos uh, that are year year old, I'm not sure how fluid and easy this would be as an as a, a true biomarker for autism. But it's uh, one of the things that people talk about. Um, other thing in terms of uh, in terms of the treatment side of things. So. Uh, what this really underscores is that when providing treatment or providing uh, learning for kids with autism, really relying on just uh, demonstrating an action is really not going to have that same effect that uh, typically developing people might, um, that it might have on t typically developing people. So it really highlights that we really need to kind of maybe do hand-on-hand -hand type of, uh, of training. Not in all cases, but for some kiddos that might be more helpful. Really um, making sure that the kiddo is actually performing the actual task you want the child to perform as opposed to just demonstrating it. Um, there's also sort of this science fiction idea that perhaps we could sort of use um, what's called biofeedback or neurofeedback to uh, then change behavior. Um, I think there's some potential there, um, but research hasn't really borne born that out yet. But what this is is the idea that we can actually change the way our brain rhythms op operate. And there's some interesting paradigms that um, use visual information and um, you can actually train your brain to the brain rhythms to actually change. The theory is that if we can change our brain rhythms, can we actually change then what's happening uh, in our underlying circuitry and then actually uh, modify behavior. Um, so research is, uh, the jury's still out on that one. Research being done looking at that right now. Um, the other piece then is if we can identify a certain neural mechanism that is underlying some of the, the deficits we're seeing in autism, then we can use medications that target specifically uh, that, those neural systems. So uh, again, not that I would suggest this, but interestingly, uh, the drug ecstasy actually impacts mirror neuron system functioning. And I think it would be ridiculous to start handing out ecstasy to kids with autism, but it sort of at least provides an idea uh, that there are medications that are available and we could perhaps um, utilize medications to, to modify uh, behavior in this way. But my take home message is that, well, gosh, more work is needed. We have a lot of people that are excited about this notion that the mirror neuron system might be uh, underlying the deficits we see in autism but we really don't know enough yet. Um, in addition to the study I just talked about, um, which we published a couple years ago, there's been three other studies that have published uh, similar findings. One study that found uh, something different, um, which is great in science, that sort of helps us guide and define um, our understanding of a given topic. 
Um, and so currently I've got another two studies right now that are looking at this sort of system. One, one is a study with little kiddos who are between the age of six and eight years old doing very similar type of uh, tasks. Uh, again, sort of those boring tasks of grabbing manipulandums and watching other people grab manipulandums, uh, among a variety of other things. Um, but to look at this mirror neuron system uh, in, in younger kiddos. As well, I have another study that's looking at this system in relatives of individuals with autism. Uh, looking uh, in moms and dads, um, siblings, to find out if there's any disruption or changes to this uh, system in these family members. Might again help us understand the developmental, uh, excuse me, the, the genetic pathway uh, to this mechanism. So that's a little brief overview. I'm gonna, I, I guess we get to have a break to refill our beverages and get some snacks, and then I'm happy to come uh, answer any questions we might have. Hi, so this question's about, uh, the, so, the, so something about the way you describe the mirror neuron, mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a sort of physical sense, it's kind of like an empath em empathic response. So it's kind of curious though, on the emotional side of it, is there any parallel? So are mirror neurons in any way associated with behavioral empathy? Hmm. Um, and so when, when you say behavioral empathy, just so I can understand your question a little more, uh, meaning, um, say a little more about what you mean when you say behavioral empathy. Um, so when a child sees another child mm -hmm. cry, it senses distress. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha, sure. So yeah, so the theory behind mirror neurons is that um, what might happen is, so I've got a, I've got, let's say I've got a, a given cell, one cell that codes for um, a sad face. Okay, so every time I make a sad face, as I'm growing up as a little kid, I go, eh, I make a sad face, this neuron activates. Um, when I see another kiddo make a sad face, that same exact neuron is going to activate. Eh, so I see somebody get, eh, I get this internal representation of that. So clearly no, no cells are gonna act alone, there's always, lots of integration among lots of different cells in the brain. And so what that mirror neuron cell might then tell, well, it would be, it would connect to a lot of different parts of the brain. 